Crash Bandicoot. For many people, that name will bring back fond memories of a simpler time, where games as a service, paywalls, and fragmenting your game into smaller pieces you could sell as DLC in the future just didn't exist, and you could just pop in your disc, you know, no downloads or installation required, and have a great afternoon playing as this crazy bandicoot in some tough as nails platforming levels, searching for the very last crate. Now, of course, many people today didn't get to have this experience. Maybe they were just too young or only owned a Nintendo platform and maybe saw Crash as the poor man's Mario. Well, here we are today and the latest entry in the series, Crash Bandicoot 4 It's About Time, just came out for the Nintendo Switch, where it kinda does have to compete against Mario and maybe even try to appeal to a newer generation who might not have that feeling of nostalgia towards it. So, does this game manage to keep up with the times? Or maybe it should have gone the way of the Tamagotchi and just stayed in our memories. Well, put on your favorite Tiki mask, make sure you're subscribed to the channel, and let's find out. If you've ever played Crash Bandicoot before, you already know the classic formula. And if you haven't, well, basically you will be controlling Crash or Coco from a third-person perspective, platforming in what are mostly 2.5D environments, but which differ from segment to segment. For instance, you might start the level in a semi-open area where you can fully move in all directions, and later you could be traversing a strictly 2D segment or being chased down a corridor. You will be mostly trying to get to the end of the level, but of course there are a ton of optional objectives and hidden areas for you to discover. There will also be a ton of enemies and obstacles along the way. You can only take one hit, so Crash and Coco have several tools at their disposal to fend for themselves. You of course have your jump and a double jump, which will be your main way of getting around. You also have access to a spin attack, which can be used against enemies or to smash crates. The series has always had a reputation of being on the harder side, and this game is no exception. It's part of the identity of the game. Now, we'll get into the difficulty a bit more in depth later, but it's like I wouldn't introduce a game like Super Meat Boy, Celeste, or even Dark Souls without talking about the difficulty, it's just core to the experience. This game of course evolves the formula by adding a few twists and turns which we'll get to, but basically that is the core of the experience. Hard precision platforming in linear 2.5D environments which have cool scripted set pieces. The theme of the game this time is, well, time, so think dimensional hopping where you will be traveling to different places and time periods. This of course makes the levels really varied, going from prehistoric dinosaur lands to a post-apocalyptic Mad Max style wasteland, or from an oriental style kingdom with enchanted dragons to a magical carnival with ghost-like beings. The power-ups are also themed around space and time, and they come in the form of quantum masks, which will give you an additional ability like changing the direction of gravity, slowing time, or even facing objects in and out of existence. These really impact the gameplay in a very interesting and cool way, since in a very Mario-like style of way, all the levels are designed around certain mechanics or gimmicks which ramp up in complexity throughout the level. So maybe at the start of the level you may be facing two platforms to be able to cross a larger gap, but later in the level you will be basically applying that same principle but on much more complex set pieces and combined with that precision-based platforming the series is famous for. The controls feel very slick and precise, which of course is super important for these kinds of games, where you might need to do a long chain of very precise jumps to avoid falling to your death. However, the camera can sometimes trick you into misjudging your position, so in many of the unreal sections or chases, you might confuse the distance between you and an obstacle and mistime your jump, only to be teleported back to the latest checkpoint. So you sometimes feel punished because of perception issues with the camera, but it didn't feel like a game-breaking issue and much more like an annoyance. Like I briefly touched upon before, there are a ton of segments with different form factors. There are some open environments where you can explore and maybe find secret areas or alternate paths. There are also some rail ride style segments where you will be jumping, ducking, swinging to avoid the incoming obstacles. 
or very similar corridor chases where you're trying to avoid getting caught by an enemy. There are even some vehicle sections and cool boss battles. These are all tied together pretty nicely and the levels benefit greatly from this change of pace. There are also several secondary characters you will encounter which will have their own unique abilities, which really change up the gameplay, from turning enemies into platforms but losing your double jump, to having a whip-like hookshot to hop between areas. You have two difficulty settings within the game, Modern, where you basically have infinite lives and if you die, you'll restart from your latest checkpoint, which is the game's recommended setting and the way I chose to play it, but there is also the retro setting for the purists out there, where you get a set amount of lives and if you lose them all, you must restart the entire level. There also are some quality of life improvements, like always having a circle shadow when you jump, to be able to land on those difficult crates, but this too can be turned off if you wish. In general, the difficulty is on the higher side here. The levels of course always start simple enough to teach you its particular shtick, however, they quickly evolve those ideas to give you some real challenges. There are some multiplayer options like having a pass and play style co-op, where every time you die you'll pass control to the next player, or a competitive mode where a player will try to reach a checkpoint in the least amount of time, and then pass control to the next player to try to beat them. It's not the on-screen type of multiplayer like, say, Mario 3D World, but it's a nod to the old way of playing single-player games with your bodies, where you would just physically pass the controller around. The controls are remappable, which is always a welcome addition, and there are some other accessibility options in the form of colorblind modes. I was really impressed with the overall gameplay here, and I think the greatest strength of this game is its level design, and how it makes every power-up or mechanic the start of the show, while at the same time cranking up that difficulty. It very much feels like Crash, from the slick controls to the precision platforming, while feeling much more varied than ever exploring all these different mechanics. The story here isn't going to blow your mind, but it's there to set the stage and the mood of the game. It follows where the original trilogy left off, and this time Neocortex and Entropy managed to escape their prison in the past through a quantum rift and set on to an evil scheme to conquer all dimensions. To which of course our heroes Crash and Coco must put a stop to. You will be traveling between dimensions in a quest to reunite all quantum masks who have the power to mend the rifts that are threatening the multiverse. This will take you to different places and time periods and encounter allies along the way, like Crash's old girlfriend Tana, but from an alternate dimension where Entropy was victorious, or Dingo Dal, who was previously an enemy but now retired to open a restaurant in the bayou. These have their own levels which show you how their paths cross with Crash and Coco and eventually team up to save the timelines. The cast is really colorful and has that distinctive feel and humor of the series. They are all voice acted, well, Crash doesn't technically speak, but the rest of the cast does, and while Cricky is very well done and adds a ton of personality to the characters. There will be plenty of cutscenes as you advance through the story, adding some fun twists and turns, like showing you how the evil doctors are progressing their plan. The visuals here are all very impressive, with some very distinct, colorful environments with tons of little detail, and you can definitely feel the love they put into making these worlds feel bright and alive. These also translate to the enemy designs, though they may be quite similar in purpose like patrolling an area or serving as an environmental obstacle, they are all very visually distinct because of the whole dimension theme. They go from futuristic robots to exotic carnivorous alien plants. I think they did a great job porting this game to the Switch, as maybe some of the visual flair like the more realistic shadows and ambient occlusion was downscaled, but they kept the busy environments with tons of little detail which really makes this game pop. The audio is pretty good too, from the music which changes from dimension to dimension to fit the particular mood, and it can also sync to the scripted segments or boss battles, which always makes up for a more memorable experience. Like one of my favorite levels was that of a carnival, where the enemies and obstacles would attack to the beat of the music. The sound effects are pretty good too, from weapons and vehicles to the enemies, and the voice acting is also very well done. It is pretty goofy, but fitting to the overall feeling of the game. Mm, nachos. Also, some game modes have different unique filters to them, 
like in the flashback tapes, where it uses a classic filter to nod to the original game, or in the inverted modes, where you can get a comic book style filter or play the game as if it were underwater. As for the performance, it seemed to run at 30 FPS throughout, but I did have some very occasional dips. In my about 15 hours of playtime, I must have encountered two or three drops which were significant enough for me to stop for a second and wait it out, or otherwise risk failing a jump and having to start all over again. But still, I feel this is an impressive port as it does look beautiful and it ran smoothly with only a few hiccups. As for the price, the game is 40 US dollars, but it is quite more expensive than the rest of the world, with it generally being around 60 US when converted. But there is a ton of content on display here though. The main story of the game will take you anywhere from 8 to 10 hours depending on your skill level, and from there I believe you have quite a lot more, well upwards of 100 hours if you are a hardcore completionist. Since there are a ton of unlockable skins, there are insanely hard reverse modes for each level where you can try to take on the optional challenges, which may have you smashing all the crates or getting through the level with less than 3 lives and all the flashback tapes which are all retro style levels with classic precision platforming. There are also the small yet fun multiplayer modes. And yeah, basically a ton much more. I did a main playthrough with some side objectives and I basically took around 15 hours to complete the campaign and I was really satisfied with the value for money since this is a real quality product. Things do get a little grey on the price of countries outside of the US, as I believe the 60 US dollars conversion is quite high, so in this case maybe wait for a sale, or remember you can always try to buy this from the US eShop by either changing your account country or creating an additional one. Overall, Crash Bandicoot 4 scores an 8.8 .8 out of 10. You know, some years ago after playing the Insane Trilogy, I thought to myself that it was kind of sad how many gamers today just didn't get to experience this age of platforming, and Crash really did stand out thanks to its difficulty and its cool linear set pieces, and this was Naughty Dog so they do love their cool linear set pieces. Anyway, I know a lot of gamers who weren't picking up the Insane Trilogy simply because they were remakes, and even though they had newer visuals, they still saw them as older games. Which is why I'm really glad that not only is Crash 4 an excellent game, but it still feels like that tough as nails platformer back on the PS1, which has evolved so much, and I do believe this is the freshest and most varied Crash experience yet with its excellent level design. I really do think developer Toys for Buff made a worthy successor to Naughty Dog's original trilogy, and I really can't wait to see where they take the franchise next. Anyway, that was my review of Crash Bandicoot 4 for the Nintendo Switch. I really do hope you found it useful and do let me know down in the comments if you're planning on picking this up or maybe if you already have, let me know your thoughts on the game. Anyway, I will be uploading more content to the channel so make sure you subscribe for that. I hope you have a fantastic day and remember guys, stay engaged!